Thank you, Lewis, and thanks to the Institute and the Environment for staging this for us. Um, who are we and why are we here? Uh, British Consulate General is, is based in Chicago. We basically represent Britain's interests, protect them, promote them across the Midwest. Based in Chicago, but in those cities where, where we have resonance, where there are important agenda issues for us, it's primarily business and, and the economy, but there are also issues around higher education, university links, and nothing more important for us than the environment and climate change. So what we've done is we've decanted our consulate from Chicago to Minneapolis for a week. That doesn't mean that we're just visiting here and doing a bunch of meetings. We are basically running our show that we normally run from Chicago here in, in Minneapolis. So if you want to follow us, uh, our tag is, is hash at UK in MN. We have our pop-up um, pop up consulate, which is in the sky, I know, is it Skyway, Skywalk, anyway, the, the gerbil tunnel that I was told. <laughs> um, downtown, we're in RBC Plaza. Uh, come and see us. Uh, come and see what we're up to. Um, you'll see a little bit of British silliness in there, so um, come on in. Um, what's this all about? This is, this is about us carrying on our work across the USA, around the world, including in the UK, on, on the issue of um, green, on the issue of energy, the environment, climate change. So um, we have a team with us today. Uh, we have a representative from one of our universities in the west, west of England, as he'll tell you, the real Midwest. Um, we have a representative from the UK, from my parent organization, which is the British equivalent of State Department. We call it the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, so we have Simon here. We have Jack, uh, Jack Westwood, who is our, um, we call him our sin man, but it's sin science and innovation as opposed to the other sort of sin, because we're British and of course we don't do that sort of stuff. Uh, we, have, we have Matt Zorink at the back of the room who is, is involved in energy and environment and the business side of it. So we've got, a, we've got a whole team and we are delighted to be here working with and alongside um, our partners in the Institute on the Environment. And we hope that this is a start of a, a longer lasting relationship between the Brits and Minnesota. So um, that's enough from me. I'm going to now pass it on to people who really know what you're talking about. Hey, all yours. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Lewis and uh, Council General Bridges. Um, we today's big question is how cities contribute to the global challenge of climate change, and we're excited to have two great cities talking about uh, the work that they've been up to. We have Professor Martin Big from Bristol, which you'll get to hear about the European Green Capital of 2015, and then. Gail Press from our own city of Minneapolis and the great work that's happening here. And then we'll, we'll have some perspective um, from the UK Foreign Office and then have a conversation um, and some Q&A with the questions in the room. So I uh, also want you to, to be tweeting hashtag Frontiers with the Frontier series and the big question of how do cities, local cities contribute to the global challenge of climate change. And then also the UK and MN hashtag will be great as you're following, helping the uh, online audience follow along. So uh, Professor Bridges. Good afternoon. Oh, come on, it sounds more like my students on a Monday morning. Good afternoon, folks. That's better. Right. Okay, I'm Martin. I'm from the University of the West of England in Bristol. And as I've just had my introduction ruined, I'm from the Midwest, but the Midwest of England. And if anyone wants to know, you know that's halfway to, to, to Wales, but by far the best bit. Um, I wear quite a few hats. I'm an academic, I, I teach environmental technology. Uh, I also run a network supporting small businesses across the whole of the southwest of England using the universities. But perhaps most interestingly, I was for two years chair of the Bristol Green Capital Partnership, which is the organisation which won for Bristol the title of European Green Capital for 2015. But more of all that later. Uh, hello, I'm being rewired. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I just hope this is working because I'm not going to repeat it. I can tell you now. Anyway, so let me start. And let me start. Okay, technology is not quite as good as it looks like. Let's try that. Right, Bristol. Where's Bristol? Yes. As you can see, it's in the centre of the country. <laughs> um, and, and, and as you can see, there's this small city over to the other side. Um, you know, okay, they may be slightly 
bigger, they've got uh, more people. But in Bristol, we're different. We're edgy, we're challenging. And I'd like to introduce you, if you haven't met them before, Wallace and Gromit, our local residents, a major product of Bristol. And in Bristol, we don't have barriers between science and art. We all do the same thing. And one of the things we're proud of is our balloon festival. And what's more, Bristol is the best place in the UK to live. Everyone keeps telling us, because all the students come to the university study and they stay, which must prove it's the place to be. And I would equally say it is a student city. It is exciting, it's dynamic, it's diverse. Lots of colour, lots of activity going on. If you want to have a uh, hen night, a stag party, graduation, it's the place to come to. They come in from Wales, they come in from Swindon, they come in from the south of England, because it's exciting. And it's all part of the experience, which is why I'm rather keen on Bristol, because I will own up, I was once a student there long ago. <laughs> and as the university pays my way, I'm now doing a brilliant plug. And actually, if anyone feels like tweeting um, hashtag UWE or hashtag Bristol City or hashtag um, Bristol 2015 so that they know I'm here doing something useful, <laughs> that would be extremely appreciated. <laughs> particularly um, the plug for the university. OK, all you know is the same. It's just that we think we're different because we like to do things differently. We merge the design, the art, into the science and the engineering. And the one thing we do claim is we're very good at finding jobs for our students because they come out nice and rounded and challenging. It's not like Oxbridge in London where you're really good at doing the really good things. But actually, when you try and have a discussion, or particularly after a few pints in the pub, actually, they're hopeless. Whereas our students <laughs> to keep going. Right, um, what are we going to do? Uh, oh, this is actually a bit of work from one of my students, believe it or not. Um, we do scenario planning, we do long-term thinking, because Bristol is a city that looks to the future. And what I'm here today talking about is about the future. If ever there was an issue that's going to affect our future more than anything else, it's climate change and scenario planning. And we know there are a whole series of scenarios. I'm not going into the debate of whether climate change exists or not, or who is causing it. What I'm simply saying, we've got to prepare for the future, whether we're business or the city. Which is why we went for the title of European Green Capital. It's a competition run by the European Commission for any city in Europe. And we've tried for three times. And we won it on the third attempt. I have to say, because I led the delegation the second time, there's some northern city with some brass mermaid sitting outside it. <laughs> Beat us to it. But we won the third attempt. And it's because, OK, we are quite good in some things. We're actually quite good at managing our waste. We're quite good at mapping our air quality, even though it's actually not very good. We've got good access to open spaces. But it's also being ambitious to change for the future. And a role model. We have problems, and I'll share some of the problems with you, because one of the reasons I'm here is actually to find out what solutions you've got and pitch them and take them home again. That's one of our ambitions, is just borrowing everyone else's good ideas. Um, also, actually, we were quite good when it came to doing the technical work. You know, we did actually write the good papers. Admittedly, this time round, at the third attempt, I got my academic colleagues to rewrite all the papers that the municipality had written, and they were far better as a result. Admittedly, they were twice the length, but they're actually far better. <laughs> and we're a good company down here. You know, uh, you, you've probably heard one or two of these minor cities, but as a consequence, we're in good company. And as a city, we believe it's about networking globally. It's about working with others and learning from them. So why did we win? Because um, we worked at it. We worked at it for years and years. But also performing well in, in, in terms of the, the main criteria of the city. But another point, and I'll come back to it, is partnership working. We now have in the city our Green Capital Partnership, which has got 750 organizations from universities, from businesses, from community groups, all working together on environmental issues. Everything from planning, transport, and getting people together with a common agenda who would probably never talk to each other otherwise has been a major success. Um, we're ambitious. And I have to say, and you'll figure it out later, it's about having a bit of fun together as well. 
So we've already started our year, and of course, the way we started our year, we've all gone green. Um, I, I have a slight affinity to green myself. Uh, we have uh, turned our major bridge in the city green. We've turned the city hall green. We've turned the university green. And what's more, it's renewable, because we just turn the lights off and they go back to being boring white again. So it, we do see some changes there, and it creates an impact. Oh, by the way, it's not fireworks, because fireworks aren't necessarily environmentally friendly. But if we generate our energy using renewable energy, that must be environmentally friendly. But we have ambition, and that's really what drives us. It's about sustainable living. More and more people are living in cities globally. Our cities are the generators of the future, and therefore they have to be sustainable. But it's also about the local people in the city, and I'll tell you what we're going to do to help them. It's about leadership, the example that we're creating, and that international connectiveness, the examples that we pick from other cities working together on solutions. So we started with a whole set of, of priorities, and I've only got time really to, to dwell into the energy one, but I will pick up on transport a little bit later. And we've got to do something about energy. We've got to do something about climate change. We set ourselves targets, because quite simply, if we don't, we won't make any step forward. We've got to achieve. So we've set some targets, so short-term and long-term, politicians particularly, check there aren't too many politicians in the audience here, um, like long-term targets, because no one's ever going to hold them to account. But it's a commitment that we've actually got to believe here. And particularly, reducing energy use itself. <coughs> We waste a lot of energy. Our power stations in the UK, if we're lucky, our coal-fired power stations are about 38% efficient. We've wasted the rest already. So what do we do when we then consume it domestically? We waste a lot more of that energy. So we could save so much with little effort. Oh, well, by the way, talking about waste, uh, this bridge here, um, I mentioned it earlier, um, built 150 years ago, almost exactly, and it's built of recycled chains. These came off a bridge in London, and uh, being local enterprising, we bought them, and we strung them up across the river 150 years ago, and it's been staying there ever since, and it's provided a useful connection. But a useful reminder what you can do with recycled materials. It is leadership. Um, meet George. George Ferguson is our mayor, he's an independent, he's uh, a visionary, he's an architect, he wants to make a change. He also has 22 pairs of red trousers. Um, <laughs> as a consequence of winning the European Green Capital, he's actually bought two pairs of green trousers. So he is now seen occasionally in the city wearing green trousers. But he's out on his bike. He's got an electric car, he's got his bike. And whereas before we had a place at the city hall for the limousine, we've now got a cycle rack. And it sends the right messages right across the city. But it's about having the resource within the city council. It's about, if I may say, the environmental management systems, leadership by the council. But it's also doing things. We've got biomass boilers at our local zoo, in our schools, local nurseries, using locally derived materials. We've got a major program of putting solar panels on schools and local buildings. In fact, one of the biggest issues is getting agreement from those who are concerned to protect our heritage that we don't damage our buildings. But we've also got a hard target for the council itself to actually really make a difference. And what's more, they're achieving it. Admittedly, one way of achieving it actually is downsizing the council, reducing the number of buildings they've got. But they are achieving the target. So give me credit for that. The local authority, the municipality, owns a lot of houses. We've got about 80,000 properties right across the city, mixed in with private housing, tenanted housing as well. And a lot of people in that housing can't afford the costs of energy. So one of the issues that the council has to address is just the cost of energy, as well as the reliability supply. But working with communities, because it's so much more cost effective putting in installations across a whole street rather than odd houses, and getting support from the whole community. It's an example. So, so far today, we've improved one in six of the total houses around the city. And it's about partnership. It's about getting private funding into the city. And so far, we've actually made a real difference. And we've seen a significant improvement. So things are already changing in the city. But I say it's continued about partnerships. I mentioned our Green Capital Partnership earlier on. 
we've got a local carbon challenge for all businesses across the South West. Anyone, Google, go green, and you'll find it. We just launched it, uh, lose track of my days here, uh, yesterday in Bristol with my vice chancellor leading with the Bristol com business community, encouraging businesses to look at their energy performance, identifying improvements, and then sharing that knowledge. So we get accountancy firms actually sharing, working with other accountancy firms, as well as manufacturers working with other manufacturers. Working with supply chain to speed up the supply chain, reducing costs. A lot of cooperation, cooperatives established to save energy. Um, Green Doors, an example of where an individual house owner has made improvements, open the doors to others to come and have a look. If we can do it at one house, then all the other houses in the road can do it, the other houses in the neighbourhood, and working together with different neighbourhoods. And perhaps most importantly of the whole issue of being the European Green, Green Capital is to empower local people. It's no good just having a title if it, all it means is that we have great conferences, and actually enjoy conferences, particularly the dinners and the drinking. But anyway, we actually have uh, involvement with local people, local neighbourhoods. And we got £7 million from central government, and we've given £2 million of it away within the first two months into neighbourhood partnerships, neighbourhood initiatives, um, sharing knowledge about home insulation, travel plans, through to some strategic partnerships about how about reintroducing drinking water to our fountains in the city so that we don't need to go and buy lots of plastic bottles of water. It's amazing. You go everywhere around the world for conferences, and what do you get? A plastic bottle of water, usually from 100 miles away. Admittedly, when we actually opened our green capital year, the local ca uh, uh, company said, you know, we'll do all the catering for you, we'll make it green, or we'll have uh, lots of water on the table, which came from Scotland. <laughs> Little challenges, says, and getting everyone involved, volunteering. And it's not just the hard science, the technology. It's actually art installations that link with different messages, the green renewable energy message. To and particularly a major program for schools, a three million pound program getting two things, A, school buildings improved, but also into the curriculum, knowledge of climate change, climate issues. At my own university, we now have 98% of our students, as part of their uh, education, whether it's in business or in architecture, has a sustainability component. Because we believe that, you know, irrespective of the debates and issues, we have to think, is this design, is this product, is this way of working long-term sustainable? Now, I had to talk about transport because I was rather impressed when I first arrived at the uh, airport here with the, the metro. And I thought, oh, right, my perception of American cities is completely ruined. They actually had <laughs> public transport. Uh, but we have a serious issue in Bristol in terms of air quality, like many cities in Europe. And this is a, a map we did of, this is, this is Bristol, this is the seven um, estuary here, and somewhere over there, you know, out of the picture, is Wales. And, oh, and somewhere over there in, is London. But you'll be able to see that this funny shape here, the poor air quality follows the roads. And in, much of it is a directly attributable to traffic. And so we're doing a lot of monitoring, continuous monitoring right across the city for these pollutants and others. Um, we have a real problem with nitrogen oxides, attributable, I'm afraid, to particularly to the diesels, but also to the car traffic. So only yesterday did our mayor launch new proposals for low emission zones. You cannot take a vehicle into the centre unless it is of a particular air quality standard. Similarly, the proposition that we will actually charge the users of particular vehicles in the city. Believe it or not, we are the UK's cycling city although we do have lots of hills. Gee, if anything, I mean, it's so difficult to be the cycling city. It's flat. It's absolutely brilliant in comparison to, to Bristol, where I spend my time getting absolutely knackered going up and down the hills. And what's worse, I have to say, is all these students are taking me as I go up these hills as well. And there we are. I think they're making a point there, but there we are. Anyway, but the other side is slowing down. 
fastest you go, all that you do is get to the next set of traffic lights and stop again. And so right across the core of the city now, we've got a 20 mile an hour speed limit. That has done two major things. A, it's reduced the pollution because there's less stop and start, it's steady going. It's also considerably safer for cyclists because cyclists tend to go a bit more slowly than cars. Drivers have more time to think about it. Very controversial because the proposition, I have to say, from the council officials was, well, there are these um, side roads that we could uh, turn the pedestrian, uh, sorry, reduce the speed of. No, the councillors all decided, let's go for the whole city. So that's what we've done. Also, a metro bus system. We couldn't get the money from government for a tram, much as I'd love to have a tram like yours, but we, we're having high-speed buses. Unfortunately, as I just picked up from our local news today, um, they, they've started work on putting in this new bus lane, and we've already got uh, people in trees protesting that um, some trees are going to have to be cut down. That's good old Bristol. You know, when we launched our European Green Capital with all the civil dignitaries from Europe coming to Bristol, we had people up in the trees campaigning that, no, we don't deserve it, go away. Um, that <laughs> please all the people all the time. Uh, we're also putting in a new local rail network. And changing our buses. Our buses are a, a real problem. They are significant contributions to pollution. So we're doing two things. Um, actually, I was going to say, you know, this is a great idea. We've got these uh, diesel hybrid buses. I just tell you, you've got them all over the place anyway. Um, but our ambition is that they will be geofenced. When they come into the city, the diesel shuts down, they have to be electric. And throughout the whole of the centre of the city, they run on electric. And only when they go out into the suburbs, out into the wider area, then they go back onto diesel. So making a major contribution there. And our other loved one is the poo bus. Um, taking the waste from our local sewage works, which takes all the waste from the whole of uh, Bristol, uh, <coughs> phenomenal amount of, of uh, waste there, plus taking waste food in a huge anaerobic digestion plant and producing biomethane. And uh, I didn't appreciate it. only takes five of us to run the bus for 300 kilometers. So you can actually produce more energy from the bus than you use traveling on the bus. Think of that as a positive contribution to the environment. So we are getting there. OK, it'll take some time. But I'd like to finish with a, a positive picture of, of Bristol. Um, for those of you who ever think of life beyond Minnesota and Minneapolis, um, there is the UK where we actually are trying to do a lot of green things. We are only too keen to welcome you, particularly if you've got ideas, initiative, solutions. As I said earlier, we're desperate to hang on to our solutions. And we do mix the old and the new. Um, this sailing ship here was a, a mock-up of one that John Cabot is alleged to have sailed across and discovered America, or at least started trading with bits of America a long time ago. We've also got, I'm afraid, um, one or two uh, major roads which got built before we said, hang on, we don't want major interchanges in the centre of the city. Let's get people out and um, driving around our city rather than through it. We're working at it. So Bristol is a great place to be. It's a great lively city. And I would simply say, please, I want to hear about your perspective of what we can do, what your solutions are, and I need to be happy to share more challenges with you. So thank you, thank you all for coming. Feel free to heckle me. Um, uh, there's some great, great people in the room, great, great knowledgeable environmentalists. I'd like to point out Mr. Dayton over here. Would you raise your hand, Chuck? Probably one of the best environmental lawyers in the state. <laughs> Saved the Boundary Waters and did lots of other great stuff, and he should be up here talking today, probably not me. So anyway, thank you for inviting me. This has been a really great opportunity to talk to the Brits about what's going on. I think for Minneapolis, it's really important that we understand what's happening in Copenhagen, what's happening in Bristol, what's happening um, in Oslo, that there's, there's great things happening all over the world, and more and more we're realizing technology is there. It's a lot of its political will and trying to figure out the resources to make things happen. So these exchanges are really important. Thank you very much to you for hosting us.
real quick. Um, how many people here live in Minneapolis? Great, 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 great. So yeah, I'm speaking to the choir. So um, just in case you didn't know, we popped 400,000 400, people in population this year. Great number, something to keep in mind, in the 50s, we had a half a million. So we're not back to where we were before the Rust Belt, you know, before white flight. Uh, people had a lot more kids then, and so it was a whole different type of city, but it's kind of interesting. We have over 40,000 people living downtown Minneapolis now, which creates just this great opportunity for density and transit and bikes. Um, a little bit about the city, so there's over 3,000 employees, and we have 65 to 75 buildings, so we're trying to make sure that we're walking the talk. But, you know, not to forget that we're 54 square miles. We're a built-out city, which has its own great opportunities and challenges than a lot of our suburban neighbors, and we can talk more about that. And of course, we have 150 parks, something that we're so dearly, dearly fond of. And thank, thank goodness for our founding um, elected officials for making sure that our lakes are something that are accessible to all. Um, just a couple of really quick things on climate change. I usually don't start by talking about this, but you know, I think anybody listening to the Minnesota Public Radio kind of reports that are going on this week, really, really good. If you haven't been listening, go on to mtr.org and look at their climate change report. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's here. It, everybody knows it's here. Actually, there was a poll that was recently done nationwide where the great majority of people in the poll said that climate change exists, including those that identified as Republicans, over 50% of the people that identified as Republicans said that they believe in climate change. Um, so it's, it's becoming more and more of a fact, so what are we going to do about it? A little bit about what this means for Minnesota. So again, I strongly encourage you to go onto the NPR website and, and hear more. You can hear Will Steger talk about changes he's seeing in the state. You can hear lots of other um, science experts talking about it. but. Climate change is happening, um, and here's what we can expect in the future. 78 days every summer will be over 90, 90 degrees. 28 days over 100. You thought last summer was bad? You know, by 2050, this is the expectations. Extreme heat. You can tell Minneapolis is going to no longer be immune. Um, for me, this is a really big one. We're, our biggest storms, our biggest rainstorms every year, are going to be 31% more intense. This is a picture of Duluth a few years ago when they had their storm. So you're going to start seeing 20-year storms happen on a much more regular basis. So this is what we have to figure out. Not only do we have to reduce our carbon here, what we're doing now, but we also have to start planning for this new future. It is coming. There are going to be different species of trees. Some are going to die out. So there's going to be different plants. There's going to be different effects. We have to start thinking about um, our, our whole systems as that's happening. And for you that are students here, this is what you get to inherit. So that's why I put these slides up, because you're the ones that are really going to have to do some deep system thinking on this. Um, everybody always talks about rising sea levels. Maybe in some ways that would be good for us, because then we would have something that we could point to that's like chaotic and necessary. Ours is much more subtle here in the Midwest, but it still is just as devastating. So why should we take action? Actually, local communities are willing to act. You know, the feds have talked a lot, but they really haven't done a lot. The state has set some great goals, but um, I think there's a lot of us that feel that they could be moving faster. Um, we, as a city, have a lot of tools that we can use, and I'll be talking about those. Um, we can have an impact. Over 50% of people in the world <coughs> now live in an urban area. There's been this dramatic shift. And so urban cities have to take some leadership. And this is what's really important, is that there's a really good business case for looking at climate adaptation, looking at reducing our carbon emissions. Because you know what? Um, as Martin mentioned, you know what? If you reduce your carbon emissions, that means your air is cleaner. That means you have a better tree canopy. That means you're in a community where people want to come and live and work and play. And then also, I really do think there is this whole idea of what are we giving to our next generation of people that, as a city planner, I get to think long term about where Minneapolis should be. And um, I think that legacy is really, really important. 
especially since you know we're building roads that last 30, 40 years. So much of our in infrastructure lasts um, a generation or two. So Minneapolis is a climate leader, and I know Minnesotans, we don't like to brag. So I'm just stating the facts here. Um, <laughs> In 1993, we were one of the first cities in the country to actually put together a climate, a climate reduction, a CO2 uh, reduction plan. Unfortunately, it kind of stayed on the shelf. And when we went to go back a few years to try to recreate the numbers, we couldn't make heads or tails of it. We couldn't figure out where they came up with anything. We couldn't find the files, so we've kind of started all over. But um, since 2003, I think since you know the Ryback administration, um, and moving forward, thanks to the voters who really have said that this is a priority for our elected officials, you've seen a lot of great things happen. I'd like to point out there's some folks here in the room that uh, this 2007, the Next Generation Energy Act, um, Ellen Anderson is in the room, Kate's in the room, I think Jeremy's in the room, you know, legislators who help get that all through. Um, I think what's really interesting now is we have CO2 goals, and our goals are 15% reduction by 2015 based on 2006 baseline, 25% reduction by 2025, and we've challenged ourselves to have an 80% carbon reduction goal by 2050. What's really interesting is that seems really radical. The state passed that many years ago, and Hennepin County has too. So there's some good policy in there, in place, but what we have to do now is start really saying 2050 isn't that long off, and how are we holding ourselves accountable to having this, this trajectory of getting to these great emission um, targets. 2013, our climate action plan was approved by the council. Who here participated? Any of you participate in that plan? We had, good, good, good. We had um, hundreds of people participate. We had six diff five different groups meet on a regular basis for over a year, really trying to talk about what's it going to take to get to these goals. This was a very important process. It helped to get a common understanding, and it helped really build up, I think, some strong support for the city to take some leadership positions, which ultimately led <coughs> to us having some really interesting conversations, and I don't know who here was part of them, of really saying, how, what's our relationship going to be with our utilities? Um, Al, will you raise your hand? Al is here with Centerpoint Energy. He's our natural gas provider in the city. Uh, Ani was here earlier. She's with um, Excel Energy, who is our electrical provider. But what do we want that relationship to be? Our franchise agreement was coming up, and um, there was some talk about municipalization, which was um, a very fascinating conversation that I think was very smart and very healthy for the community. Um, ultimately, we decided not to um, go with uh, municipalization, but we did a change um, our relationship with the utilities. I'll be talking more about that. And um, I think it's something that many across the country are starting to look at. We're talking to lots of different people. In 2014, the Obama administration actually listed us as one of just a few cities that are considered climate action champions, which allow us to get more points for going after federal grants. We're getting, we're requesting more technical assistance on a couple of our priority areas. So we want to leverage that as well in the next couple of years. So anyway, getting to, you know, I, I don't like to talk about greenwashing. I think it's really about performance measures and where are we at. So in 2006, here was our baseline. You can see electricity consumption is where most of our greenhouse gas emissions came up with. 2012, man, we were rocking. In 2012, we had reduced our carbon emissions by 12% by 2006. And remember, our goal was 15% by 2015. It was like, man, we are, we are rocking. We're going to get there. Anybody remember what the weather was like last year? Yeah, yeah. So what you see now is our natural gas consumption compared to the previous year went up 30 percent and that just boosted our carbon emissions but that's a, that, those are the challenges we face so you can see waste is really important but um, we don't even have it on here waste solid waste is this tiny little thing so when you look at what should we be concentrating on it's electricity natural gas and transportation those are the three major sectors if you've got limited time, limited resources, where you should be going. And there you have it, kind of the same, same information. Uh, 
catch up here. So one of the good news is out there is transportation. Um, anybody know for the university in 2014, what was the percentage increase in ridership compared to the previous year of transit? 10%, you guys. That's phenomenal. Overall, in the metro area, transit ridership increased 3%. The university had increased 10%. I don't know how or why, but you guys are rocking and rolling. Anybody know what Friday is in terms of bikes? Friday is International Bike to Work Day in the Winter. <laughs> <laughs> now, here it is, folks. We are, I think, number eight right now worldwide in getting people to sign up. Get online. I think it's going to be like 28. You know, it's not that bad. Get online, register, and let's get above number eight in terms of winter bike to work. Um, I know I'm an alum from here, and I know I couldn't afford a car, so I used to bike in the winter all the time. Don't do it now, but take the bus. Um, so anyway, about our, our climate action plan. Um, this was a really, really good tool. Basically, these are our recommendations. So you had talked, Martin, about reducing your energy use 30% by 2025, or 2020, I think. When we went through our analysis, we said we can reduce our energy use 17% by 2025 and still meet our 25 by 25 goals. You see there's a lot more interest in waste in there, a lot more biking and transit, a lot more in renewables. Um, but it was, it was an interesting process. And then as I said, we started thinking about, well, what's our relationship with the utilities? And it was pretty controversial. So we hired Center for Energy and the Environment to really look at the options. What are the legal barriers for trying new things with our utilities? What should we do? And uh, it was a good study. It's online. I think other cities could use it and not have to pay what we paid for it. Um, but it basically said, you know, municipalization in Minnesota is pretty tough. There's some state laws that make it pretty cost prohibitive to do. Basically, we have to pay profit losses for at least 10 years, which is a couple billion dollars. Um, so that kind of said, okay, we're not gonna municipalize. But that being said, you know, the, the utilities have climate goals. They're actually national leaders. The city is a national leader. Why don't we work together rather than work apart on some of this? There's always gonna be things that we disagree with, but we think there's a lot of commonality there. And so that's where we decided to um, move ahead with their recommendations and sign a franchise agreement. It's only 10 years now, it's not 20 years. But we have this side agreement and we're calling it the Clean Energy Partnership. And we're, rec we're creating an advisory committee. And I'm gonna put a plug in that advisory committee. We're accepting um, applications right now. So if any of you are really geeked out on energy policy, apply and you're a Minneapolis resident apply for our advisory committee. So the Clean Energy Partnership is council, mayor, executives from Excel and Centerpoint. They're gonna meet quarterly. They're gonna have a two-year work plan. There's gonna be annual reporting. Again, this is not about greenwashing. This is about really putting our hearts and minds together and saying, how are we gonna meet the city's goals of clean, affordable, local, and reliable energy. How are we going to change this system with the tools that we have? So we're going to have metrics. Staff teams, we're already working. Al and I both should be at a meeting at 1.30. Um, but it's really about driving change. No other city in the country has tried anything like this. And i got to give Centerpoint and, um, and Excel credit for taking a deep breath and going forward. So here's some ideas that we're working on. You know what, we're kind of running out of time, so I don't want to go too far into them. I think that um, commercial buildings is really going to be important in terms of 60% of our um, electricity use comes from commercial buildings. Multifamily is really important. Over half the people in the city live in a multifamily building. They don't live in a single family home. Mm -hmm. And you know what, 75% of people who are poor live in a multifamily building, so there's an equity issue there. Um, there's a lot more financing options we need. There's a lot of apps. We're having lots of different conversations about apps for the next generation. So if you've got ideas on what kind of apps you'd like to see, I'd love to hear them. And then we want a city enterprise. We want to make sure that we're walking the talk. We have 48,000 streetlights in the city. They should all be LED. We're, we're moving into LED, but we have to do it a lot faster. And it makes sense. 
So how can you get involved? Make sure you get an energy audit, use a home energy squad. Anybody done this service? Yeah, it's so good. They, they're experts, they walk in, they give a blow door test, they tell you what your financing options, they tell you what your payback is. You don't have to make that many decisions. Uh, WinSource is a great program. It may cost you a couple of cents more a month for your electricity bill, but it actually may not. And wind sources means you just get 100% of your electricity supplied by wind. That's above and beyond the state mandate from Excel. It's a great program. All you do is sign up. Um, everybody's really interested in solar. I'd be glad to talk to people about community solar gardens and what that means. Basically, you don't have to put solar on your roof anymore. You sign up for one of these big uh, sites across the country or across the state. Of course, biking. We, we pride ourselves, Martin, on being number one or number two, depends on who you talk to, uh, for biking, or number three. I think New York's doing some great stuff. Uh, this year we're going to have eight open street programs. How many people have ever been to open streets? So basically we block off eight blocks and we <coughs> say, okay, people, bike, walk, no cars, let's have a party. And they're really fun. And it's a great way to get people out and seeing what it's like to bike in the streets. Um, Transit, as I mentioned, transit is a huge part of air quality and our carbon footprint. Um, and there's some more work that we need to be doing there, that you can all be doing. And of course, we all always want you to recycle and compost more. Um, the last thing is advocacy. I don't have a picture of our city council because I don't know if our city council members would like that. But um, <laughs> advocacy is, is incredibly important. That when you're looking at who you're voting for, ask in public, where is their stance on carbon? Where is their stance on climate change? Where is their stance on other environmental issues that are important to you? The Public Utility Commission is this strange organization that has a powerful effect on energy policy. But your legislature, legislators are really important. Your city council members are really important. Your president is really important. And this is really, I, I can't believe how much I believe in democracy. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But the policymakers are only going to do what people tell them or what they're hearing. And it does help to make those calls and to tell people that you care. So thank you very, very much. I know we're kind of running late and we want to get questions. So I will take a step back. I work for the government, I work for the British Foreign Office, um, that's our equivalent of the State Department. In that job, I, it's, it's my job to do whatever policy the government says it has. But I want to start by declaring a vested interest. I actually care about climate change myself. The reason for that is, I have a daughter who's three years old. If she lives to the same age as any of my four grandparents did, then she has a reasonable chance of seeing a global climate that the world hasn't had for several millions of years, possibly tens of millions of years, depending on how far it goes. That probably isn't going to be a good thing, I think. To use a phrase that I've heard quite often, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I was actually before, I'm not anymore. <laughs> but I don't think that sounds like a very good thing. I spend a lot of my time talking to scientists, climate scientists, trying to understand what they understand so I can communicate it to our government and other governments. And a lot of it is very complex. A lot of it is quite hard to communicate. But there are some aspects of it that are relatively simple. One is that we're adding a lot of energy to the climate system. Something like one watt per meter squared of the atmosphere. Uh, you can understand that in different ways. Um, James Hansen describes that as one Christmas tree light for every square meter of the atmosphere. To me, that doesn't sound very frightening. But there's a German scientist who describes the same amount of energy as four Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs going off every second. That sounds like quite a lot. We're adding that amount of energy to the atmosphere. And the first law of thermodynamics tells you that energy has got to go somewhere. It doesn't all just vanish. And it's, it's obviously heating things up. Um, as, as Gail already said, a problem that's not so much talked about is the extreme heat that you could get on land. There's actually points where 
the, the levels of heat and humidity that you could get could be exceeding people's actual upper limits of tolerance, meaning that you can't really go outside. That sounds like a big problem to me. The one that's much better known is about sea level rise. A lot of that heat's going into the ocean. In fact, over 90% of that heat is going into the ocean, and surprise, surprise, with thermal expansion, the ocean is getting bigger, the sea level's going up. Now, in, in UK climate policy, I think the story really starts with sea level rise, in a way. We're a small island state, and we guessed that sea level rise might not be a good thing. So we paid some scientists to do a study. And one of the things they found was that with just one meter of sea level rise, then what used to be a one in a thousand year flood on the Thames estuary coming up to London would become more like one in 12 years. That, that sounded like bad news, but we all thought, well, that's okay. We've built a massive big barrier down on the Thames. Um, we designed it to protect against a one in a thousand year flood. We can probably make it a bit bigger. It'll be okay. But they looked in great detail at all of the UK and they realized there are lots of bits of it that don't have as many bankers living down close to the river as London does, and they won't be worth protecting. We actually won't do that. We'll withdraw it instead, and we'll lose land. But of course, some people do live there. And when they sat down and they showed these maps to the members of parliament, then the members of parliament looked at them and went, hey, that's my constituency, that bit there that you just said we're giving back to the sea. So, not long after that, when they had a vote in Parliament on the Climate Change Act, which was one of the first, maybe the first, serious piece of climate legislation in the world, we have over 600 members of Parliament. I think it was three that voted against it. The rest all voted for. So I'm glad that, that there's a strong political consensus that realized we've got to do something about this. Having said that, it's, it's not easy. The easiest thing you can do is set some targets. The hard thing is figuring out how to meet them. So we started by setting some targets. We said, if we want to be anywhere close to a two degree pathway, then world emissions in 2050 need to be something like 18 gigatons of carbon. Divide that by nine billion people in the world at that point, it's got to be about two tons of carbon per person. That's what our targets are based on. And we realized that if we only had a 2050 target, then we wouldn't do anything because most of our leaders would be dead by the time that comes around. So we worked it backwards and we've got a series of five yearly carbon budgets that get us from now until then. However, even the budgets on their own aren't enough, so we've got to figure out what do we do. First thing we do is use less energy and Martin already talked about those kind of things regulating cars so they become more efficient over time, doing the same thing for buildings, putting incentives in where you need them. The other thing is trying to have the right kind of energy. And we think we need about 100 billion pounds of investment in new electricity generation over, I forget how long, the next couple of decades. We want that to go into energy that we want for the long term, not the energy that we don't want. So. The most important thing I think we did was put a price on carbon, and we started doing that in London, and then we got the whole of the EU to do it as well. The other thing that we're doing is having long-term forward contracts for clean energy so that the government takes on some of the risk that would otherwise put off investors from investing in them. So we're now writing contracts for electricity supply quite a way into the future coming from clean energy sources. But the, one of the reasons this hasn't been easy, there are many, but one is that this is a global problem and it's a systemic problem. And we weren't expecting you guys here to figure out how to frack so much gas. <laughs> Which was a good thing for you, but of course it meant you started exporting a lot more coal. And about half of that goes to Europe, and when coal got cheaper then our carbon price wasn't quite so clever anymore. And in the UK in the last couple of years, we've actually started burning more coal than we were before. Germany has done too. That's a big problem. So we're in the Foreign Office, we're working in almost every country in the world to try and get everybody to move on this all at once. It's pretty difficult if you're going it alone. It's much easier if everybody moves at the same time. And 
we've been working with a lot of big emerging economies, helping them map out a pathway between now and the next 30, 40, 50 years, trying to figure out where's their energy going to come from? How is it going to meet their objectives of energy security and availability and reducing their carbon emissions at the same time? We've been working with other countries on legislation and with others on carbon markets. In China, we've been deeply involved in setting up their seven pilot provinces where they're already putting a price on carbon and trading it. One of the things I would say from that is that we've realized there is a certain inevitability about change. We don't know whether change is going to happen quickly enough or not to avoid dangerous climate change. I think that still depends fundamentally on politics. But change will happen for various reasons. In China, the, the air quality in the major cities is so disgusting that they've already decided it just can't get any worse. And the interesting thing, if you look at Chinese coal consumption, this is not just words. It's not just a lot of nice sounding propaganda. Things are actually changing quite dramatically. Chinese coal consumption was growing at about 10% per year, which is why everybody used to repeat that they were building two new coal power stations every week. But last year, it only grew about 3% compared to the year before. And this year, it seems to have actually fallen compared to the year before. And we don't know if that's a blip. The Chinese don't know. It might start going back up again. But nobody's expecting it to get back on 10% a year. But the demand for energy is still increasing and will still increase. So it's got to come from somewhere. It won't be from coal. And China's investing, obviously, more in clean energy than any other country. India, a similar thing, but for different reasons. For India, most of their energy generation comes from domestic coal, but that's not enough. They don't have enough of that to meet their demand over the future. It can come after this from one of two sources. They can either import the coal, or they can generate more energy domestically from clean sources. Importing coal is incredibly expensive, and when they map it out into the future on a business-as-usual pathway, then they see there's only one result, they go broke. So they can't do that. So we're absolutely sure that change is happening, and we want to be ahead of the game. The Confederation of British Industry reckons that we already have about a million jobs in the low-carbon economy in the UK, and that it's contributing about a third of our national GDP growth. So if this change is happening, we want to be ahead of the game, um, both for the sake of making some money and for the sake of our kids.